Just experience this of LangSafe. Uh, these are my conflicts of interest that have nothing to do with this talk. And really, it's been a, a huge team effort. So like, I would like to, jo to join uh, John in thanking everybody, and particularly the people in the executive committee and Tai Pam, who's sitting there, that has been really uh, working hard on this data. And it's been a, a huge team experience. And uh, also the people at uh, ESICM, particularly Guy Francois, who's been really supportive with this study. Uh, John has already explained to you about these, uh, the structure of the study, so I just uh, skipped through these uh, slides because really uh, it's the, the very same uh, slides you've seen before. Uh, this is something which is nice to show. It, it was something they, that maybe uh, we didn't expect when we uh, began the study. Uh, it was a very optimistic scenario, but in fact, uh, in a way, the lung safe is some, somewhat a global study because you see <clears throat> this is the number of ICU which we were able to uh, recruit and that is basically mirroring actually the number of patients. And you see, of course, we have a strong uh, presence here in Europe, but of course the United States and North America in general gave a very positive response to the study, South America, <clears throat> Uh, Asia with China and, and Japan and, and also Australia and New Zealand, Frank Van Aren, national coordinator, did an outstanding job. So uh, really, uh, with some limitations, I think LungSafe is really a, a global study looking at the picture throughout the world. Uh, this is a cartoon that John has already shown you. I would just like to point out uh, that uh, I will be uh, telling you about these numbers here. And we have several hundreds of uh, patients in each RDS category. So there is, I think, st some strength in the numbers we have. Uh, so first of all, what is our target in ventilating these uh, uh, patients? This is the uh, average PaCO2 on the first day of uh, um, patient admission in the ICU. Most of the data which I will show you today refer to day one, but uh, if you look at day one, day two, I mean the first days of the acute phase in our patients, the data look more or less alike. So which is the uh, target that we have uh, in when we set the ventilator of our patient? Which PCO2 we target? And as you see, I put some bands here for, a, let's say, normal PCO2 or for what we would call a uh, uh, permissive hypercapnia. We see that uh, permissive hypercapnia is not still very much used. We know that uh, some um, recommendation allow the use of permissive hypercapnia uh, to reduce tidal volume and ventilation, but it looks like we are still a bit reluctant to allow PCO2 to uh, raise above 50 uh, millimeters of mercury. And in many cases, we actually uh, many of our patients, it's about 40% uh, of our patients are actually hypocapnic. Of course, some of these patients were in shock, so this could actually reflect the need to compensate the metabolic acidosis, but still, uh, in some cases, it, one might speculate that the, the patients are actually overventilated more than what we would actually need. And so the second question, clearly the, one of the burning questions coming out from the, uh, from the study was, how do we use tidal volume? This already John has alluded to. And what we see here is that tidal volume on average is, I would say, slightly above what you would call a protective tidal volume. So in the range of 7.5, 7.6 uh, milliliters per kilo. There is, in fact, a statistical significance on the drop of tidal volume over the different categories of ARDS. But really, when you have such large data set, it's easy to have a statistical significance. But uh, I, I don't think that we can call them uh, very clinically different uh, once you compare a tidal volume of 7.7 .7 to 7.5 in uh, mild and severe ARDS. This is associated also uh, to a not so uh, large difference in respiratory rate, which is on average uh, quite lower than what is reported, for example, in, in clinical trials. I think in the uh, first study on low tidal volume by the RDS network, the respiratory rate in the treatment group was uh, close to 30, uh, something like that. Here, it looks like we are a bit reluctant 
to increase uh, respiratory rate where when we start to hit uh, 20 breaths per minute. But still, we all know that these patients demand high minute ventilation because of the dead space, which is the other side of the coin of uh, increased shunt and uh, worse hypoxemia. And this is another way of looking at, the, at uh, our uh, data, which is it is the distribution of tidal volumes over the three categories of ARDS. You barely distinguish them because, in fact, they are very much overlapped. Here in black, these are all ARDS patients. And it, it's a matter of where we set the threshold for calling a tidal volume protective. If we set a threshold to eight, like John said, it looks like about 65% of patients get a, a protective tidal volume. But if we set a threshold more conservative to six ml per kilo, it's about 40% uh, of patients who receive a protective tidal volume. Uh, what about uh, the use of uh, uh, spontaneous breathing and neuromuscular blocking agents? And you'll see why I'm bringing this up now connected to the issue of tidal volume. You all know, and Antonio has shown you already, uh, this paper by Laurent Papazian that showed an improved outcome of uh, uh, RDS patients who receive neuromuscular blocking agents. Uh, if we compare what is in the literature with what we see uh, with what was reported by our investigators. It looks like in uh, uh, moderate and severe IRDS, a limited number of patients is receiving uh, neuromuscular blocking agents. In fact, it's only about one third in the severe ARDS. Does this have uh, uh, consequences? Well, it, it seems uh, because we have a, a fairly large fraction, about a quarter or a third of patients who actually some evidence of spontaneous breathing. Uh, in our study, we defined the presence of spontaneous breathing as a difference between the total respiratory rate and the set respiratory rate, which is a quite rough way to, uh, to define the presence of spontaneous breathing, but still uh, is quite reliable and it has been used before. And as we can see, once again, this is a concept that has uh, uh, been uh, brought up already today. Uh, we see that spontaneous breathing and the loss of control over tidal volume is in fact associated with an increase of tidal volume. Uh, we do not achieve statistical significance here in the um, severe group because it's maybe a smaller group, but still in every single category of ARDS, tidal volume tends to be higher when spontaneous breathing is allowed in ARDS patients. Uh, these are the modes of ventilation. Sorry, many, many numbers here, but for those of you who are a little bit more interested in, in, in uh, let's say, ventilation modes, you might find these interesting. Uh, volume control, uh, volume assist control, and pressure control in its various uh, forms are quite often used, but still there is uh, quite some uh, use of forms that allow spontaneous breathing, like uh, SIMV, or even in severe RDS, we have some 5% of patients who are managed, managed totally with uh, assisted breathing. Uh, what about pressures? Uh, which are the pressures that we record? Peak pressure, it's, uh, I would say, in, in a fairly low uh, range, uh, but uh, we all know that plateau pressure is, is more important. And if we look at these, uh, than peak pressure, I mean, uh, if we look at these data, it looks uh, quite reassuring numbers. Uh, of course, plateau pressure goes up with the severity of the disease, but still the mean plateau pressure, even in severe RDS is below 30, uh, significantly below 30, about 26 centimeters of water. Now, the, the bad news is that it looks like uh, we don't seem to consider plateau pressure as a very relevant number to uh, measure. In fact, uh, the plateau pressure is measured overall in about 40% of the patients. And once again, if we think that uh, maybe physician couldn't measure it because patients were undergoing spontaneous breathing and we just focus on the patients undergoing controlled mechanical ventilation, we hit 50%. So we are measuring plateau pressure in every other patient, basically. 
And so this is the similar plot, like I've shown you here. I, I brought back the one, sorry, the, the legend is missing, but this is tidal volume. You see this is very overlapped because as I said, we do not seem to be adjusting tidal volume much depending on the severity of the patient, but clearly plateau pressure is, is very different mild, moderate, and severe RDS. But if we set the cutoff at 30 centimeters of water, it looks like most of the patients were below this number. You've seen this cartoon already from John. Uh, it, what this figure tells me is that we are a little bit uh, more concerned uh, in reducing tidal volume when we see that plateau pressure goes above 30 centimeters of water. Still, you don't have to forget that about half of our sample size is outside this plot, simply because plateau pressure was not uh, recorded. How about PEEP setting? This, I think, is, is uh, most surprising, uh, one of the most surprising findings of this study. Once again, uh, PEEP increases uh, with the increased uh, severity of the disease. Once again, statistical significance, but if we look once again at the numbers, the increase is, I would say, modest, going from 7.5 PEEP in the mild ARDS up to 8.3, up to 10. So really, the, the, I, I would not have expected that the average PEEP in severe ARDS would be around 10 centimeters of water. Now, this is the plot of the <coughs> sorry, uh, PEEP levels uh, as a function of FiO2. What you see here, so very nicely superimposed by Thai, here in, in red, is what is the NIH table for low PEEP. Uh, not everybody has to use the NIH table, but it's just to give you like a, a benchmark, a reference point. So you see that as soon as FiO2 goes, goes above 60% uh, or as soon as PEEP hits 10 centimeters of water, uh, the, the PEEP levels that we observe in our patients are by far lower than even the low, so-called low PEEP table of the uh, NIH, uh, not to speak about the high uh, PEEP uh, uh, table of the NIH. So generally, PEEP levels, I would say, are rather low. Uh, this is just uh, the similar data again, switching a little bit to median. The reason I'm doing this is to tell you that, for example, if you take uh, severe RDS, once again, you had a median of 10 in the set PEEP, meaning that 50% uh, of the patients had 10 of PEEP or less. But still, the median FiO2 was 1, meaning that half of these patients were on an FiO2 of 100 uh, no, not certainly higher. Uh, you could think that this is the first day patient had just come in the ICU, so waiting for some uh, stabilization of the patient. If we look at the day two, you see that PEEP levels are exactly the same. Here there is a little drop in the mild ARDS patients, but the, the PEEP levels are exactly the same and still, I would say, quite in the low uh, range for our uh, ARDS patients. And once again, just to give you a, like a, a, a reference number, this is the uh, mean PEEP levels that were uh, calculated in this uh, uh, meta-analysis, taking together all the um, a number of studies on PEEP settings. So uh, by far, in the clinical practice, we are applying clinic, um, PEEP levels that are lower than uh, what has been used in the clinical trials. Uh, also, well, this has been uh, shown already, so I don't need to show you this. In the last uh, uh, minute of my talk, I would also like to allude to driving pressure. There has been uh, a nice talk about that uh, uh, recently. Uh, we all know that this number is somehow uh, coming through in the literature, and we also want to challenge our data with uh, uh, this uh, evidence. And uh, even in our cohort, we've shown that uh, really there is a, a remarkably difference in survival uh, between the patients who have uh, 14 centimeters of water of PEEP or less and those who have a higher than 14 centimeters of water driving pressure and that driving pressure is associated with mortality uh, in a similar way uh, than plateau pressure is. Uh, so uh, this is 
whoops, sorry, the very last slides that is also showing how we use non-invasive ventilation. This is very preliminary data, but just to show you that the use of non-invasive ventilation is not confined to mild ARDS, but we are using uh, non-invasive ventilation more or less in the same way, independently of the, on the severity of the disease. Uh, my conclusions are that we are still uh, under using a bit uh, tide, mm, low tidal volume. Uh, plateau pressure is not often uh, measured, but still it rarely exceeds 30 centimeters of water. We tend to use uh, peep levels lower than what we would generally expect, and we mainly correct hypoxia by increasing FiO2. And uh, we would like to dig more into the database to see and understand better how ventilation is able to affect outcome. Having said that, I thank you and all the investigators who participated in the study. Thank you very much.